I am Sunshine Menezes, Metcalf Institute's Executive Director here at the University of Rhode Island. And I'm very happy to welcome you to today's career development program um, discussion about time management and project management as a little bonus. Um, today, I am very excited. I should start actually by noting that we're recording this. So I saw that there was a question in the chat about providing slides. We will have a recording of the video, which we will post on Metcalf Institute's YouTube channel. So you will um, be able to see it there. And also I want to note right off the bat that this program is supported by the Rhode Island Sea aim program, which is funded in turn by the National Science Foundation and the Established Program to Stimulate Competitive Research, or NSF EPSCoR. Um, through the Rhode Island Sea aim program, we developed this career development program, uh, or CDP, in case I fall into that habit of the acronym, specifically to provide professional development training and opportunities for people who are early career in, in science careers, um, whether you're a senior level undergraduate or a graduate student or a postdoc. So we're really glad to have all of you here today. And specifically, we're very excited to have Dr. Raul Pacheco Vega, who is an associate professor. Of course, there are sirens going by my house right now. Um, an associate professor <laughs> in the methods lab at the American Faculty for Social Sciences in Mexico City. We're especially glad to have him because he is someone I have been watching from afar on Twitter. Uh, he has incredible time management skills and you're going to learn a lot more about this and his specific um, approach toward time management. But I wanted to note quickly that he has a, a really interesting um, uh, professional background himself as both a geographer and a political scientist who is working at the intersection of those spaces, um, looking at how um, various factors contribute to or hinder natural resource governance. So he's looked at wastewater, um, uh, pollution control, solid and hazardous waste management. And um, so his his research interests are actually of, of great interest to the Rhode Island CA project as well. Um, I wanted to note that because Dr. Pacheco Vega is an avid tweeter himself, um, he encouraged us to use a hashtag for today's program if you are someone who's active on Twitter. And that hashtag is RPV, as in Raul Pacheco Vega, time management. So RPV time management. M-G-M-T, all together. And of course, um, please give shout outs to Raul, at Raul Pacheco and at Metcalf URI and at RI EPSCoR while you're at it. And then finally, one more quick thing. Um, I just wanted to note that the, the CAIM uh, Career Development Program offers a Career Development Certificate. I know that a number of you have just signed up for this, but as a reminder, uh, if you haven't done that already, the certificate requires that you complete five required training topics, one of which is time management, so check, um, three electives from a very, very broad list, and there's no time limit for this. So you must indicate your interest and register via our website, which you can find here. It's just metcalfinstitute.org backslash career development, and there you'll find all the information you need to know about this. One final housekeeping note, please everybody um, change your name, rename yourself if needed in the Zoom box so that we can see both your first and last names. We need this information so we can check off your attendance here today. And, um, and then once we've done that, then we're good to go. So I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Dr. Pacheco Vega. Thanks so much for joining us today, Rob. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Sunshine, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm very excited. This is, um, I give several versions of this seminar uh, all over the world, and it's the, my first time joining uh, the Medical Institute, and I'm really honored that you um, invited me, because I really think there's a lot to discuss. I will be doing a presentation, yes, but there will be also some time to do group work. So during that group work, we will stop the recording and then we will return to recording once the group work is completed. 
my talk today is going to be on how we can do time and project management within academic and research contexts. And these uses a very specific system, which is a, a system I developed with the Everything Notebook. So again, thank you so much for the invitation to Metcalf Institute, Dr. Sunshine Meneses, and the Career Development Program. If you're live tweeting, as Dr. Meneses has just said, uh, you can use this model. You can list a quotation, my uh, Twitter handle, and then the hashtag RPV time management. I want to just acknowledge that we're in the middle of a pandemic. So take anything I suggest here as aspirational and suggested because your first priority should be your health and your life and that of your loved ones. So my objectives with this seminar are to show you and to help you learn a few time and project management techniques that I've developed all the while mastering my method of the Everything Notebook for organization, time and activity planning, and time management. All of these, obviously, within the pandemic. So I ask all the time on Twitter, what kind of challenges do people face when planning their time? So some people have answered, well, I'm embarrassed to say this, but finding time to manage my time. The week following goes more smoothly if I pull it off, though. Other people say, well, it's number of tasks divided by the time, not enough hours in the day for the competing demands, specifically during the semester. Then other people say, curling my own brain during my writing times to ensure that I'm actually doing the thing. I can research and write and generate medium of ideas, but the slow march of steadfast, painstaking progress to finish is so hard. And then Last but not least, managing what I want and what I would like to do with what I have to do. And this happens to me quite often. Sometimes I get great ideas about writing something that I actually have no reason to be writing and then I end up doing so. So my goals are offer first, offer a few suggestions how, on how you can manage your time, your projects and yourself and present you with a few options and strategies that you can adapt to your own needs. I can also, and I'm hoping to be able to walk you through some of my own techniques live, so I can show you how I do that in my own day-to-day -day life, online, while we're in the seminar, and then discuss with you issues that may arise when you have to think about managing your time. Because in the end, there's only so much time and energy we have, so we need to protect ourselves. This is something I learned very, very late in life. I suffered chronic fatigue, chronic, chronic pain, psoriasis, and uh, eczema and dermatitis for a very long time, for four years of my life. I have almost died four times because of overwork. So if I can give you one piece of advice for this seminar is take care of yourselves. This is the most important thing I, I think I can share with you. So how do I plan to conduct this workshop? I'm going to walk you through how I apply my backcasting technique to research projects that I undertake. And then I will show you how I backcast a revised resume in a paper. I chose these two particular techniques, specifically backcasting a project and backcasting a revised resume because I think these are the ones that are most representative of the challenges that researchers, early career scholars, faculty and practitioners have to face. We often fail at managing our time because we fail at planning our projects. So I'm gonna do both time management and project management during this workshop. And then I will address some questions that you may have during the entire project planning, time management and associated topics for the rest of the time of the seminar after I walk you through my backcasting model. So standard rules of engagement apply. This is a safe space to have discussions about thorny topics. And this includes obviously the fact that there's a dearth of tenure track positions outside, that there's a, a lot of work that we need to do and very little time to do so. So um, whichever discussion we engage in within the realm of the workshop will be obviously in a safe space. So I hope that you consider that when making the, any commentary as well within the workshop. Um, so I asked this question 
on project management just yesterday. And I said, I'm teaching a workshop on time management and project management. And I already adjusted my seminar to COVID issues. Please tell me, you know, what are your main challenges? And as you can see in the second quoted tweet, 37 people responded. So this is an issue to which people actually are, uh, of which people are aware and to which people are responding right now. And COVID has made this need for time management and project management even more acute because now, because we're working from home, we need to really be careful about what we choose to invest our time on and how. So as a scholars, teachers, professors, early career scholars, uh, practitioners, we even practitioners who participate in any scholarly work, we need to write, research, manage, do service and teach. And that's just on top of general adulting, on top of general life. So we need to write a lot of research grants, papers, feedback on students, um, we need to provide to do research, reading, reviewing, not taking. We need to manage people, labs, budgets, equipment, and we need to provide service to our discipline, field, university, etc. As well as teaching, preparing slides, writing slides, um, reading materials, grading, and providing feedback. But this is not the only challenge. So we're not the only people who face this challenge. Other people do, like students and staff as well, you know, studying, note taking reading data scavenging, assembling data sets and cleaning data sets, you know, interviewing, uh, applying for grants, writing prog progress reports, etc. So, you know, dealing with life as it is, or adulting as we call it, um, is part of the process. So the, all of this on top of parenting and care work, even though I'm not a parent, I do have care work to do because my parents are aging. So I understand that this is a challenge that we need to deal with. Even more compounding these issues, there are issues of ableism and uh, challenges that people with different abilities also face and disabilities as well. So this is important that we consider as well. So the way I think we can manage our time is by planning before stuff hits the fan. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit in very rapidly about how I plan my academic year and how you can do it, how you can plan your calendar year and how you can develop weekly, monthly, daily and semester uh, long plans. So um, how to triage and prioritize your activities to ensure a manageable stress level because COVID-19 has sort of guaranteed that there is no stress-free life. We are going to be stressed, obviously, but we can and we should try to manage our stress, in my view. So I'd like to go now into one component, which is a little bit of a but, um, socio-technical diatribe. Protecting our time is seen politically incorrect, you know, because you are not contributing to your discipline, your department and your field. However, and Elizabeth Cohen actually makes this point in her book, The Political Value of, of Time, time has political value. How we allocate time, how we spend the time, and how we use it has political consequences and implications, right? And political as well as practical imp implications. So my suggestion is always that you should put your oxygen before helping others, but never shirk away from your responsibilities. So contribute, but always, always, always take care of yourself first. That's my view. So there are four elements in my view to the planning systems. The first one is time management. How much time do we have? We only have 24 hours in the day. We all have the same time. So we need to manage that time as well. Energy management, and this refers to our physical energy as well. How do we allocate the energy we have, which is limited, to the different projects we need to engage in? Then we also need to consider people management. How do we manage other individuals' interactions with our own work and ourselves? 
And finally, managing ourselves, which is always a challenge. I don't know if this doesn't happen to you, but for me, it's always challenging to say, well, I think I have 12 hours to finish something. And then all of a sudden, 12 hours becomes 24 and then 36 and then 48. And by the time I think about this, then I am like three months behind. And because of my psoriasis, dermatitis and chronic fatigue, in April of this year, I was nine months behind. Like seriously, I was, like, I was completely and absolutely behind. But what I understood was that I needed to be healthy again before even considering the idea of you know, catching up. So now I'm caught up. Luckily, this was a fantastic year. Horrible for COVID, but fantastic in my, in my academic career. I published three journal articles in the top uh, journals in my discipline. So, you know, it's, it's one of those coincidences where I was about to die and then I end up publishing a lot. However, you are relevant and you matter whether or not you publish. This is something incredibly important that I think academia changes the way we think. You matter because you're you. It, you don't matter because you have an H index of 25 or 40 or 400 or 4,000 or you're Eleanor Ostrom, the, my former professor and the winner of the um, Nobel of Economics, the first woman who did that. So on time management, and these are just tips for you to consider. Think about the fact that everything is going to take much longer than you expected to. However, I think, and this is what, ha what has helped, uh, pardon me, this has helped me manage my time. Tracking my time as tailorist as it sounds is very effective in helping me understand where my time is going. And to do that, I use a tool called Clockify, but there's also all sorts of tools, you know, toggle and so on. And we can discuss different tools while we are in the question and answer um, period. Then I, there, there's also an idea that somehow meetings need to be, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 minutes. I am a very strong advocate of shorter meetings and meetings late in the day. I. I wake up in the morning, I wake up at between three and four in the morning. So for me, writing time is any time before noon. So I protect that time. And my colleagues know that if they want to have a meeting with me, it needs to be after 12. So this is important for you to, to think about. Now, I don't manage myself. I work for a lab that is within a university. So I work for the methods lab at Flexo. So I need to negotiate and converse with all the other colleagues. The fantastic thing about my new university is that they hate meetings and their meetings are super short and they're incredibly punctual. Now, think about this. I work for a Mexican university and you know how in Mexico there's always this, you know, stereotype that mañana, mañana and, you know, uh, we arrive like 20, 30 minutes late. Well, not here. <laughs> at all, like we have a meeting at 12 and everybody starts their meeting at 12, like they're on Zoom at 12, like zero, zero. And then the meeting is, is finished between 12.15 and 12.30 and that's amazing. But it does depend on how you negotiate with colleagues. But this is the culture of my university. My previous university was not like this. They loved meetings at eight o'clock in the morning and they were like three hour meetings. And by the time I was done with hour one, I was like, okay, it's time for me to start doodling. Now, you know, don't tell that to my colleagues, but you know, it's, it's important that we negotiate all of this. Now, as far as energy management goes, I prioritize challenging tasks for whenever my chronotype allows me. So I am a morning person. I used to be a night person. And then I went all the way back to waking up between three and four in the morning. Of course, I need to have a nap, which is what I'm going to do right after this workshop. Um, and then I need, I need to also, you know, sleep early. However, obviously, the, you don't need to wake up at ungodly o'clock. Like, ungodly o'clock is for, reserved for people like me who are crazy enough to wake up at three in the morning. But I find that that time really allows me to concentrate on my own work. And because I work early in the morning, you need to also know where and how you work best. So this is important. Rest is fundamental. So I hope that you take this opportunity 
if anybody tells you, you can say, Professor Pacheco Vega told you that you need to rest. So this is important and fundamental. And one of my approaches to energy management is just to say, I'm going to do two things a day. And this is my second thing. So my first thing is I gave a seminar earlier in the morning at University of, of Glasgow, and I'm doing this seminar. And this is all I'm going to accomplish today. I don't care if I read an article, that would be fantastic. But this is my second thing in the day. And that's all I'm going to care because that's all I really have energy for. Um, you're probably going to tell me, well, I have like 4 million things to do. So do I. But the thing is, we need to recognize that we are people in fragile bodies. So we need to be able to manage. If you manage to do at least two things a day, you'll notice how then after time you can say, okay, now I'm going to do three things a day. But this needs to be kept to a manageable minimum. So I hope that you take that. I do this. I hope that you take this um, as an you know, as an enticement. No, as a very gentle encouragement, word of encouragement. You should probably consider, you know, resting more and doing two things a day. On people management, uh, establishing and communicating priorities is important. So. My priority in this case for today was to just be able to teach this seminar and teach the other seminar and that's all. So after this, if anybody wants any a piece of me, they can forget about it simply because these were my two priorities and I booked time for this months ago. Also align your priorities with the people you want and will work with. So for example, I only seek collaborators with similar values and beliefs. One of my co-authors, her husband, um, a few years ago, um, her husband got really ill and I picked up the slack. And then I got really sick last year and she picked up the slack. So, you know, you, 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 I only collaborate with um, people with similar values and beliefs. And I think there is a very strong, um, there is very strong value to doing this. And then I also recommend minimizing multiple st stakeholders meetings and establish strict meeting times. This is important. Something happened to me this week where somebody's inviting me to give a seminar next week and wanted to jump on Zoom for an hour to talk about how we were going to organize the Zoom meeting next week. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We can do this in five minutes on a quick Zoom and that's it. Um, and this is a workshop on water conflict. It's a topic I know well. So I really felt, well, why would I need a Zoom to talk about the Zoom I'm willing to participate in? So the more stakeholders you have in the meeting, the more the, the higher the chance that your meeting is going to go long. So I would strongly recommend to minimize stakeholders' meetings and establish strict meeting times. I have to go pick up my children or I need to pick up my mom or my dad, or I need to go to the doctor. So it's it's important. Even if you right after a meeting, you should make an appointment with your writing and say, I'm sorry, I have a meeting now. Even if that meeting is you shutting the, your, your door and write, that's your meeting with yourself. And you should respect your meetings with yourself as much as you respect the meetings with other people. Then self-management. Oh my God, I'm so terrible at this one. I'm terrible at saying no. It's easier done than uh, easier said than done. If you ask me, I I am terrible at saying no. I'm absolutely terrible. And because I'm terrible, I will tell you you should get a no committee. And a no committee is a committee of two or three people who can say, Oh no no no, Raúl, where are you going? This opportunity doesn't help you. So no no, this is a no. Um, and a no committee is fantastic. And if you want me to be on your no committee, that would be like 33 people on for a no committee, but I'm happy to be, you know, you can just send me the opportunity and I can help you say no. That's, that's important. Spend less time on devices. So this is why I have analog planners and books. Um, I do have my everything notebooks here with me. And if I have been in Rhode Island to teach this seminar, I would have brought my everything notebook. This is a friend of mine calls it the Beyonce of everything notebooks because it's a popular one. Everybody takes selfies with my everything notebook. So if and when we ever get to do this in person, I'll bring my everything notebook and then you can do a selfie with this one. Um, exercise, eat properly, sleep enough. Sleep is fundamental. 
um, and scheduling more breaks. And that's one of the reasons why I also wanted to do like an in-class exercise and do breakout rooms because it's important that, you know, even those small short breaks where you talk to other people are important so that you can maintain your attention in a seminar. So how do I plan my academic year? This is, I'm, I'm gonna go relatively fast through this so that we can have a much longer time to converse on how this is executed in person or, you know, each one of you. So the first thing is I, back, I establish every commitment I have. So when I joke with you and I say, can you invite me please for a seminar next year? I'm actually not kidding because my schedule like literally fills up in within weeks. So I would recommend that if you have something to discuss with me, we plan it for the next year, right? Because I plan one year in advance. This sounds ridiculous, but it actually works wonders because then you can see visually what time you have and what time you don't have because you're going to travel. Well, right now we don't tra can travel anywhere, but let's assume that, you know, we control COVID and we will travel to Europe. You need to budget two days before and two days after because of jet lag, right? Um, so I map all my travel, all my conferences, all my commitments in a year long calendar. And then I establish deadlines for each specific project I do. And then I apply what is, I apply what is called backcasting techniques to my projects and I do reverse engineering from the goal I have to the very first task that I need to do. For school commitments, it's challenging, but it's not impossible to do. So based on the conferences, I schedule and I write them sequentially and I print a yearly calendar where I block my holidays and the times I'm traveling. All like every one of my everything notebooks, let me see if I can show you on screen, but each one of my everything notebooks does the same thing. I, I have the year calendar at the beginning of the notebook. And that way I know where I'm doing, where I'm going, what I'm doing all the time. I then write down paper commitments and so on, and I apply backcasting to each one of those, and then I map them out in monthly calendars. I do have my commitments and my wish list, and if you can see, my wish list for 2020 is submitting my doctoral dissertation into a book because I always publish papers, so I want to now publish it as a book. What you see on the screen right this very second is the backcasted plan for three years for my biggest project to date. It's a project on water conflict. And what I did, I'm going to show you on using the annotate technique, um, I'm going to show you. Knowing that this is, these are the outputs that I intended to have on year three, the ones that you see in pink. So I started mapping out from the text of my grant backwards from the date that I was supposed to submit the final report and then what I did is I backcasted in this direction. Oh God, it's not, it's not gonna go very well, but anyway, I'm backcasting in the direction of the first semester of the three years of my plan. So what I did, and I'm gonna show it now in red, is for each year, I planned what I needed to do research-wise, like an agent-based modeling of conflict, and then what I needed to write. And then I moved backwards so that I could, so let's see if, uh, no, this is a different one. Let me see if I can do the, no, this is too small. Okay, let me see if I can, if I can make, um, if I can do the spotlight. Yes, so I'm gonna do the spotlight. So what I did, if you see in red, what I did is I planned backwards from the actual product that I was generating, the third white paper, backwards to activities of project reporting, data analysis, and instrument design. So my team and I designed the instrument in the first year, and then we designed the questions, 
Then we undertook field work. And on the second year, we started doing web scrapping and text parsing and social network analysis so that we could produce these two white papers in the second semester of the second year. Why do I suggest that we should do um, that we should do backcasting techniques? Backcasting has an advantage because you go from the final product backwards and you plan backwards, you can see if you need to catch up or if you have some time or some leeway for the project that you're undertaking. This requires you to break down each one of the activities of your project into manageable portions. So this shows you the manageable components of my project per semester in th along three years. And for example, what we were allowed to do was the year one report, we were allowed to submit it on year two, at the end of year two. Not every granting agency will allow you to do this. So this is important for you for how you backcast a project. Now, you can also backcast or do reverse engineering of a uh, revise and resubmit. And that is the, whenever you submit a paper for um, peer review, when you are trying to develop the response to reviewers, maybe what happens to me can happen to you. I end up realizing that I have a lot of work to do. But then I break down the, I break down the, I'm going to just do um, spotlighting. I break down the response to reviewers into specific suggestions from the reviewer, which I then break into specific pieces of work, which I then break down into different tasks. Each one of them has a deadline. And then I map those deadlines onto my monthly and weekly calendars. Backcasting a, re a revise and resubmit has the advantage that you don't feel overwhelmed by the number of the sheer number of projects or the sheer number of tasks that you need to do. You can just focus on finishing one task on the blank one, and then you go on to the next task on the deadline two, and so on. This works, and, and I, I apply it uh, in, in different projects. And this works for response to reviewers, revise and resubmits, or even revising documents when you are doing edited volumes. Now, I do this kind of planning using what is called a Gantt chart. This is a technique from project management. And Gantt charts, the way I go and use Gantt charts, and I'm going to show you the one that I already have in, in I already have one, give me one second, I need to open. I have one on screen, but I'm going to open one that I already have for you. In my, in my documents so that you can see how I manage this, this technique. What you see on screen is a map of all the different tasks from top to bottom. And from left to right, you see a sequence of months and you can see which activities need to be done on each month. So for example, I needed to do some work in 2018, in September on literature on institutional analysis in October, um, conflict theory, framing analysis, and so on. However, I don't plan forward. So I don't decide that this is the structure of how I'm going to tackle a paper. I do it opposite. I do it in the opposite direction. And now let's see if I can draw and I can show you uh, a flag. So I do it in this direction and in this direction. So I start with my product. I start with the end product. And the end product is, for me, a revision of a paper. So that's my end product in the square you see there. And then I work backwards and in upwards. And that's how I feel the different tasks that I need to do. I do read it, and I'm going to change the color now. I do read it in, in this direction. but in reality, I, so I read it in this direction and that's how I should execute it, but I plan in the opposite way, okay? 
this is important and I'll, I'll, I'm happy to email Sunshine so, so that she can email you. I have a template for a Gantt chart that you can use for your own projects and, and test drive the technique right now, okay? So let's see now. Then, oh, I need to delete this. Give me one second. Uh, how can I do? Give me one sec. I'll stop sharing for a minute. So, and then I'm going to reshare so that it doesn't show you. Okay, perfect. For my monthly plan, I include personal and professional items. And then I use bright colors to highlight submission deadlines. And then I plan on a weekly basis using what I call the granular planning and the rule of three. So that means that I prioritize, I break down projects into thirds. Then I try to only work on three things a day. And then I always budget three times the amount of time that I'm supposed to be taking in my, in my seminar, so in my, in my work. So this is important. I do this and I put them down on my everything notebook, okay? On a daily basis, I, every Sunday I plan my week and then I confer with my monthly plan and my previous to -do week, uh, weekly to-do list. And if there are items to migrate, then I move them, I prioritize them. And then I synchronize commitments and meetings with my co-authors and so on. And I schedule personal time on a daily basis. All of these, so you see my everything notebook and my monthly calendars on screen. Everything is synchronized to my Google Calendar and my iCal. That way I know exactly when I have to be and what I need to be doing, okay? You can do only digital calendars if you choose to do so. I need the redundancy myself. So before I go into the Everything Notebook, I wanted to ask if there are questions that you may have so far. If you do, you can use, if you click on participants, there's a little hand if you need to raise your hand. I've got something, a question. Absolutely, go ahead. So so my name is Aaliyah. Um, so you talk a lot about taking care of yourself um, and maintaining your own health first, but what if stuck have writer's block. I'm in this position right now. I have to write a 9,000 word article by October 1st with minimal time to even prepare. And it's on a topic I barely know. I have a writer's block, but I have to get it done no matter what. So how do you deal with writer's block when you're kind of living on that time and you're kind of just sitting in front of a computer wasting time? <laughs> This, uh, don't, don't worry, this, this, uh, I, I understand. So if you give me one second, um, I don't know if any of the participants read my blog, but I do have a technique to do rapid mapping of scholarship. Um, I actually have blog posts on about just about everything. So I also have one on how to develop, uh, how to fight writer's block. I don't write entire papers. I write memoranda and I will do I, I will writing by memorandums let me see if I can do that as well um, so I, I break down the papers into pieces and then I write them as memorandums and writer's blog happens to me as well on the third one because you have only eight days and I've been there trust me I've been there I have a technique to develop a paper in it's a paper from um, it's basically a first draft of a paper from uh, start to finish. If you give me 10 seconds, I will give you. So this is, I, I, I do it in eight steps. Um, and I, what I do, and I, I, I do exactly what you think that you're going to need to be doing, which is I cram, I drop everything and I finish the damn paper. And I don't work. I don't only write one day. I need to write every day. So that's that's normally what I do. The challenge is not to get to that point, which you know it's as I said, it happens to you. It happens to me as well. So what I do is I, I drop everything and I I start working on it. So my hope is that I do have some you know heuristics that you can use to draw to draw the basic map of the literature 
and then um, write the memorandum reference like that refer to each one of the stages in your work and then write the papers like a first draft from start to finish. I've done this in like 12 hours. So maybe these three blog posts will help. I would write the paper for you, but I'm definitely not in your field, but I completely, I, it happens to me. All I'm saying is it happens to me. I drop everything and the, the, the only way I can not feel overwhelmed is by thinking about the fact that I don't need to write an entire paper and I write memorandums like bit by bit. That's all I do. And even if it's an entire day of bits, like, you know, I'm going to write four paragraphs between eight and nine, and then I'm going to write four paragraphs between two and three. So that's basically what I do. I hope that helps. Ian has his hand raised. So um, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, I, yeah, I'm Ian. And I, I have a question about the way you tackle some of this longer term planning when you have say you're trying to develop a Gantt chart or use backcasting techniques for a project where the deadline has maybe three or four, it's like a three or four month window. An example is we have these annual seminars. We don't know exactly when we'll have them, but there's, there's a reasonable window, but do you just, how do you, how would you approach something where you don't know the exact deadline and how, yeah. Um, I try to just invent a deadline and because if I don't have a, an exact deadline, I lose time, I waste time and it's super easy to waste time. Again, I'm not perfect at this. I am sharing some of the techniques. Um, I'm going to share with you my, my, my calendars just so that you see the kind of weeks that I have. Give it just one second. And I'm going to share it just so that you see. So I'm teaching four courses, which is why I, and I pushed everything, all my teaching to Mondays and Fridays. And it's insane, like absolutely insanity. By the time I'm done uh, with the seminar, the, with my classes, I'm absolutely dead. So what I try to do is I block time in the morning and then I have a writing group that I'm actually not joining this week because I, I'm teaching a seminar at University of Glasgow um, but I do try to, I do try to sort of organize time. I, I understand, you know, being stressed because I feel stressed the same way, but I try to block chunks, like large chunks of time that allow me to just work on, on projects. Now, with regards to your specific question on no deadlines, I, I establish a deadline. And this has happened to me with my book. One of the reasons why I have not finished my book is because I allow the deadline to just be pushed forward. So now this year, I, this month, I just said, I'm gonna finish the book on October 15, come hell or high water. So that's what I'm gonna do. And that may mean that I may not say yes to any other seminar in the next three weeks or four weeks. So um, that's what I do. And I hope that helps. Great, thanks. Any other questions? No? Okay, so as a matter of a break, I'd like you to, and for that, I will ask uh, Sunshine because I don't seem to have the breakout rooms. I will ask you to, in groups, prioritize the three to four more important time challenges that you have within that group. Obviously, you don't know each other. I assume you don't know each other. So this is going to be an interesting exercise. It's 12.44, let's do like, Four minutes each. Sounds how good. Many groups do you want? How many people per group do you want, Raul? So let's do about four per group. So that makes about seven groups or so. Excellent. I'm going, I don't think I can actually jump in between groups. So I'm just going to join one and then we'll see you in about four to five minutes. Hi everybody. Karen, I'm gonna put you into a different group. Um, so you and I are in the same one.
What's happening here? Both. How did it go? Uh, how did it go? It went well. <laughs> I think I think there are still some people coming back from the rooms. Here we go. <clears throat> okay, perfect. Thank you. And I should have probably told you, let's just keep it at five minutes so that everybody can, can share their experience. But that's okay. Perfect. Apparently, and one thing I learned about Zoom with this uh, is that you as a host, you can do the breakout rooms, but I cannot communicate with you. So good lesson for the next time. Excellent. So how did it go? Who wants to go first? As we twenty seven, yes. Um, I could. Um, I think in our group, one of the biggest um, challenges that we faced was taking a to-do list and turning it into um, like meaningful brackets of time. Um, whether it's the like concept of the list, how it's structured, or how we're structuring our personal time. Um, and so, yeah. Excellent, thank you. Anybody else? We had, a, I guess, a question on how to deal with procrastination and like oh. overcoming that hump. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, the way I have dealt with procrastination, and this is, again, it's my own personal experience, but the way I deal with procrastination is I reward myself all the time. So that means that I, I make sure that every time I do a challenging task, I reward myself. And this is perhaps one of the biggest challenges I find, um, you know, always trying to overcome the, overcoming the, um, trying to overcome the uh, procrastination attempt is like, you know, if I finish something that looks terrible, then I can do something that I do enjoy and that I do enjoy a lot. So that's one of the ways in which I deal with procrastination. Anybody, anybody else? Um, so in our group, you're actually talking about how hard it is to keep up on respecting the time we select writing and that most of the time, okay, I have this spot from whatever I want to teach to write, and we'd rather go to the lab and do an experiment or fix a figure or do anything else than writing. So I think it's kind of challenging, and we don't know actually how to um, get better on this. <laughs> I guess this is the point, respecting the time for writing. And other thing that we commented was keeping up with a plan, not just um, having that spot for another thing. And I think it comes to the writing, the same thing. Like, let's say you have a time to experiment A, and then instead of doing A, you do B, or you go to do C. And mm -hmm. probably more related to social media, I guess, um, distracts yourselves a lot. Um, so I guess the, the final question I have for you is, how do you keep up in writing? How do you respect the time for writing and then just go forward? Okay, so um, I'll show you again my, my screen. I have, let me just go uh, into my, my screen, give me one second. Um, I have, so, okay, there we go. So I have, I'm teaching four courses, right, this semester. So what I do is I have, I blocked and this was negotiation again with my with my university. I I have a block of time for writing between 4:30 and 6:30 in the morning. That's I know absolute insanity for a lot of people, but that's the block I have. If you notice, I moved my block of writing from Monday to the Saturday because on Monday I wasn't prepared to teach the seminar I was going to teach. So I use that time not to not to write, but I use that for my seminar. 
this morning, I already was prepared to do this seminar in the seminar I'm teaching in Glasgow. So I use that time to write. I also have another blog and I'm gonna show you the next link. I also have another blog from eight to 10. That's sacred time that nobody gets into that time. I do have to cut 15 minutes early because I teach on Mondays and Fridays. So I cut those 15 minutes early, but everybody else, I, I so I, I block those two blocks of time. And then I have one other writing group on the Friday. This is super challenging because I wake up very early, then I write, I write, I teach, I teach, and then I have writing to do, and then I teach, and by the time I'm done, I'm completely fried. But that's really, I mean, just telling people I have meanings. So I don't allow anybody to, to have meanings with me on from eight to, to 10 on Monday to Friday, or from two to five on the Friday. That's the, I, I protect my time. If that's the question, if I understood correctly the question, that's that's how I do it. Um, so I, I put it in my I put it in my calendar, and it's the meaning. So this is visual to you, like this is visible to you, but everybody else who has time for for my schedule sees that everything else is blocked. So they see some space here and some space here, but everything else um, is just I have meetings, and this is a daily meeting with me for my writing and that happens in the morning and then, uh, but then obviously I need to have a lot of, so for example, Mondays, I do have two blocks of writing, but then ever forget about anything else because I have two courses, right? I teach two courses. So I need to be sure that I'm ready for this one and that I'm ready for this one. Same with Friday when I have free classes. So I need to, that's why I have full days for research for the same reason that uh, somebody else in the in in the seminar was asking earlier. I I end up having to do the you know I have to finish a paper in a day. So you know goodbye to everything else and everybody else. So, but you need to block I think that time. Now I try to be very careful about saying you have to do this, but I don't see that there's any other way. Uh, in in and this happens everywhere. I have never seen anybody that has the ability to do all of everything that they need to do if they don't block anything else. So that's why I said, you need to prioritize yourself and your own time, right? And that means sometimes care work needs to be pushed somewhere or work needs to be pushed somewhere because care work is more important, right? I, For me, any, any meeting takes no precedence than taking my mom or my dad to the doctor. And I have, that takes priority. And if that means I don't have time for a meeting with my university, they all need to respect it. And if not, then that's not probably not the place where I want to work. I mean, it's, the, everything is negotiation. Unfortunately, for ac academia is a very relational institution. So we, everything we do needs to be negotiated. But my negotiation is, my writing time is blocked and everything else is, you know, you, you can do whatever you need to do, right? Um, it's one o'clock and I still wanted to cover the everything notebook as well. But speaking of time, I want to be respectful, respectful of time. So if you do want to stay for like 15 minutes while I finish the everything notebook component, please do so. But I also want to acknowledge that you may also have blocked one to two, or actually you're, I think this is two to three for you um, to write. So please don't, don't feel um, obligated to stay. Those who do want to stay or can stay, please, um, I'll, it will take me like 15 minutes or less just to finish the final component, which is this one. Um, the, the everything notebook. So I'll start my presentation, the final component of my presentation now. And if you need to drop, don't feel uh, obligated. So I hope that um, this is helpful to you all. Anyway, uh, Sunshine, I just want to know, do you want, is it okay if I continue the 15 yeah, minutes? Please. I mean, I agree. So we definitely should wrap it up within 15 minutes, but yes, I think it would be great. Okay, perfect. 
I apologize for going over, but it was more important to me to answer questions from the participants than going over my material. So I will try to be done in 15 minutes. So give me one second. Um, so the Everything Notebook is actually everything. Like it, it has, my Everything Notebook is my most popular technique and it really has everything. It's literally a single notebook where you include absolutely everything. To-do list, field notes, summaries of articles, ideas for papers, and so on. Um, I don't use loose leaf, but you can use loose leaf. So I create my yearly plan, my monthly plan, my weekly plan, and then I break down my every notebook in 25 pages or so, and then I assign a section to my to-do list, and one for each project and one for students. So because it has everything, I use a rigid plastic tab on the side for projects. And then when I finish, you know, I, I try to link across different everything notebooks and I add a table of contents at the beginning of each one. Um, if you forget, as I do often, when I go to conferences, I take notes in loose pages and then I staple the pages to a section where they belong. And when I need to move from one section to another, I use a post-it note in an arrow form. Do you need to have an analog everything notebook? Not really, you could do this with my model with OneNote or everything notebook. It's not a bullet journal, it's not a commonplace book, but you know, it doesn't have the weird symbols of the bullet journal and it's more organized than the commonplace book. And you should not replicate my methods exactly as I post them. You're supposed to look at them and see what you can and what want to use. The advantage of the everything notebook model is that it's simple because everything is in the everything notebook and I don't carry several notebooks. But it's sophisticated enough to perform several functions simultaneously, an agenda planner, to-do list holder, work notebook, project and lab notebook. So what I like about this method is that it's searchable and systematic and you can increase searchability by making it online or if it's analog with table of contents, indices and clearly demarcated section. So some final thoughts. We all struggle with managing our time and ourselves and the best approach to time management in my view is trying to be realistic with what we can do with a limited amount of time. Our work needs to the deep thinking and reflection and our project and time management approaches must reflect these. And in the end, I strongly believe that we need to be kinder and gentler with ourselves. I think organization and planning systems need several elements. Information needs to be easily retrievable. Planning should be simple and systematic. Organizational systems and structures should make our routines easy and systems should have easy embedding. So with that, I will stop there. That's my email, that's my Twitter, that's my uh, Facebook and I'm basically done. And I'm done in less than five minutes. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pacheco Vega. That was fantastic. So are there any questions or anything that anyone wants to go over um, at this point? We'd love to have some time for Q&A. I have a short question. Um, hi, my name is Sonia. Um, how, why, why did you become a morning person after being a night person? And how did you go with the guilt of, I mean, I'm a night person, so it's really, life it's adjusted for morning people i always have to cope with the guilt of oh i am sleeping while they are working so how what prompt you prompt you to, to change and how do you feel now so i used to be a night person i finished my doctoral dissertation from 9 p.m to 9 a.m like 12 hour uh work shifts so I dated a guy who was a morning person. He, wa he woke up at five in the morning and I was going to bed at nine. And that's really bad for relationships when you know the, there is no synchronization. So what I started to do, I, I didn't want to break up with him. So what I started to do was I started to do like my work one hour, one hour early, like every week. So by the time I was done, I actually woke up earlier than he did. So. I would wake up, you know, at four in the morning, then he would wake up at five, we would go for a walk, then he would, you know, we would have breakfast. And by 6.30 in the morning, he was out the door and I could stay work and work or go to the university at 6.30 in the morning. So um, that's the reason why I did it. I did it for love and I was absolutely 
not going to dump him and I was hoping that he was not going to dump me. So that's why I became a morning person. How do I feel now? I feel amazing. I woke up this morning at three in the morning and I woke up at that time because I wanted to make sure that this was a, a really good seminar that people were, you know, found it helpful. So I woke up so that I could, you know, do some writing, check my slides again, see, you know, check the flow. Um, I'm actually slightly disappointed that I didn't finish right on time and that I needed five minutes more. So um, yeah, no, I love it. I love being a morning person, to be quite honest. I, it's hard if you have friends who want to go out on weekends or, you know, nighttime because, so I, I need to take a nap. Usually my nap is at 2 p.m. Um, I am in Mexico, but I follow, um, you know, the rules and norms from North America. So I have breakfast at around seven. I have lunch at around uh, 12. And then I have dinner at around six. So my my nap time is usually around two to thirty. So I do need a nap every day. It's, this is called a biphasic uh, biphasic uh, system, and I do have actually a blog post on how I did um, my I, how I move from to four a.m. and why I do a bifas biphasic uh, six plus one point five. Uh, it's on the chat. And yeah, I do feel better. I love being a morning person now. Um, that guy is no longer with me, but I, I can now do a lot more than I used to do when I, when I worked at night. Because everybody loves going out at night. So, um, you know, going out with my friends and then getting home at one in the, in the morning and start to write, no, not a good idea. Now it's better. I have a question um, sure. about, um, Diana, um, I have a question about uh, when you check your email, like do you set off, I find that I have my email open during the day and I'll get like a, something and then I'll be distracted for an hour because I'm then dealing with other things that are in my email. Do you check it certain times of the day? Uh, the only time when I've actually checked it before is before the seminar because I had to communicate with Dr. Meneses, but normally my rule is no email checking before noon. So uh, that's usually my, my rule. Let me see if I can, uh, no email before noon. Yes, I think um, I have basically, a, yeah, my, I, I don't do email before lunch. Simple. Okay. I'm, and that's... then I had, yes. I was gonna well, say, and I had another question about, you said that like in your Google calendar, you showed how you kept, you moved things around based on, I think like you didn't write on Monday cause you had to do some other prep work. I find that when I write things, like I keep pushing it down the line and pushing it down the line and I just like cross it off and then I'm like, I'll just do it tomorrow. But it never, like, do you set kind of more internal um, deadlines within yourself? Be like, stop pushing that down the road. How do you handle that? Yeah, so for example, um, what's gonna end up happening is that I'm gonna have to write today or tomorrow because by the time I hit Friday, I'm absolutely dead, right? So you see on my calendar I moved my writing that I didn't do yesterday, I moved it to Saturday, but there is no way in hell I'm gonna be able to do that because I'm gonna be dead. So it's better if I just move it back into one of the three days that I have a block of time. Um, because I'm so visual and I use so many colors, I can see when one, and uh, I'm gonna share again, and this will be my, my last, sorry, um, so I'm just gonna do this once more. Um, I just want to share my screen in, in, a, in, a, in a moment. So this one, the previous one, let me see, this is the week. So as you can see, I have this block. What's going to end up happening is I'm going to have to move this block back, for example, into Wednesday so that I don't have to work on the weekend. That's basically what's going to end up happening. And I have to do it or otherwise work spill out, spills over to my weekends and I'm, teaching four courses, it, it's killing me. So uh, if I want to polish anything, I need to just protect my time. That's basically what I do. Okay, thank you. Oh, um, how long do I nap for? My body doesn't respect the stupid, you know, 20 minute naps. So I nap for, 40, for uh, 45 minutes to an hour and a half. That's why my body doesn't do, uh, so the REM cycle is usually 45 minutes, 
but for some reason my body can wake up after four or five minutes and still feel okay. But it, it has to be between four or five minutes and an hour and a half. I, that's what I need. That's what my body needs. But again, everybody's different. I have like my ex-boyfriend, the previous one, could nap nearly five minutes and he would be like closing the eyes five minutes and then woke up and I'm like, no, that, uh, that doesn't work for me. So anyway, um, my email is also, I'm gonna put it on the chat. So if anybody has any further questions, uh, thank you Dr. Menezes for inviting me. And I'm so excited for having been able to join you. Thank you so very much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Raul. This was wonderful. We really appreciate your time. Um, especially seeing how incredibly well it's mapped out. And, um, and thanks also to everyone who joined us today. Don't forget, if you have not yet registered for the Career Development Certificate, you should do that. Um, again, you've got, you know, 20% of the requirements taken care of already today by participating. And um, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, thanks again, everyone. Take care of yourselves.